Florida is home to a vast diversity of an amazing group of organisms called lichens. Now, what are lichens? Well, they're not plants, they're not animals, but they are living, breathing, growing, reproducing complex organisms, the result of a seemingly impossible relationship among organisms from three kingdoms of life. There's a saying that goes, Freddy Fungus and Alice Algae took a lichen for each other, and many people think that's the end of it, that lichen are a mixture of fungus and algae. That's nearly there, but the reality is a bit more complicated than that. Lichen are actually made up of organisms from the kingdoms fungi, plants, and bacteria. An association of separate organisms living together is often referred to as a mutualistic relationship. This is defined as two or more organisms living in a mutually beneficial arrangement. An example of such a relationship would be the clownfish that lives amongst the stinging tentacles of a sea anemone. The brightly colored clownfish acts as a lure that draws other fish into the anemone's deadly grasp. The clownfish's immunity to the anemone's toxin allows it a safe place to live and it gets to feed on the scraps of food left over from the anemone's feast. The anemone, meanwhile, gets the advantage of a live-in fishing lure. See? Mutually beneficial. Win-win. Now, lichens are a little bit different. Although there are multiple organisms present in a lichen, like the clownfish and the anemone, it could be argued that the rewards aren't really very fairly distributed. The fungus, or mycobiont, of the lichen is completely dependent on the other occupants for its very survival. The algae and bacteria, on the other hand, can survive quite well outside the relationship. Therefore, rather than a mutually beneficial relationship, there are signs that the fungus is actually parasitizing or taking nutrients away from its host, the captive algae and bacteria. So try this. Imagine a lichen as a small jail made of fungal tissues, with the inmates, the algae and bacteria, producing sugars via photosynthesis. The fungus provides the structure of the lichen, and it eats the sugar made by the captives. When talking about lichen, those photosynthetic algae and bacteria are referred to as the photobionts. We'll look at them next. But first, fungi. The most common fungi present in lichen belong to the ascomycetes, or the cup fungi group. Remember this, it's going to come up again later. Cup fungi, ascomycetes. These fungi produce cup-shaped structures called ascocarps, which are lined with spore-producing sacs called asci, containing, you guessed it, ascospores. When ascospores are released, they germinate and grow into a new generation of cup fungi. The capacity of this group of fungi to produce these cup-shaped structures is often maintained when these fungi are involved in a lichen. If you look closely, and we hope you will, it's possible to find lichen with these little cuppy growths, ascocarps, with ascospores in them. Now, for a long time, scientists studying lichen, the lichenologists, of course, they could not understand how the same combination of mycobionts and photobionts could lead to entirely different lichen species. Recently, an additional player has been proven to exist in this arrangement, yeast. You've heard of yeast, right? Yeast are single-celled fungi. They're funky fungi, best known for their ability to eat sugar and burp carbon dioxide, giving bread its rise and beer its foam but yeast have recently been found lichenized. And this explains why the same species of lichen cannot be created in the lab by combining known fungal and algal components without the yeast present. Now just what, if anything, the yeast is actually doing or contributing to the survival and success of the lichen and its habits has yet to be established, but we do know that they can influence a lichen's appearance. So those are the fungi or the mycobionts in lichen. What do they do? They create the structure of the lichen, they adhere to the growing surface, they prevent drying out, and they steal sugar from their algae bacteria captives. As for the photobionts, 
Let's examine the algae first. Now, when we say algae, we're referring to true plants. Even though they exist as single-celled photosynthetic sugar factories, they're considered part of the plant kingdom of life. One genus of algae that's often assimilated into lichen is Tribugia. Tribugia exists in the wild as a free living algae found on the surface of soil, on tree trunks, and even fence posts and rocks. Tribugia is tough. It can survive extreme heat, cold, drought, you name it. Tribugia just keeps on ticking, photosynthesizing, and surviving. This makes it a good candidate for locking up in a fungus jail to form a lichen. Another green algae, Trentophilia, is also a microscopic plant often found in lichen associations. This genus is terrestrial and can be found in many of the same habitats as Tribugia, although in the tropics it can also be found growing on the surface of plant leaves. Now, despite being a green algae, Trentophilia also contains other pigments besides green chlorophyll that often give this algae an orange or yellow appearance when found growing freely outside the lichen association. The other lichenized phytobiont group are the cyanobacteria. We used to call cyanobacteria blue-green algae, but having the word algae in the name kind of muddied things up. Algae is algae, bacteria is bacteria. One of these bacteria, Nostoc, exists in the environment as chains of bead-like cells often massed into gelatinous blobs. These blobs can occur on the surface of the soil where, after a good soaking rain, appear as green jelly blobs, sometimes called witch's butter. Nostoc, or witch's butter, take your pick, has a magic power beyond photosynthesis. Special Nostoc cells called heterocysts have the capacity to fix atmospheric nitrogen into a form that's available to other organisms as an environmental nutrient. As we've mentioned before, the evolution of lichens has resulted in the inability of the lichenized fungal species to survive as free-living organisms. They've become too specialized and too dependent. Even under near-perfect laboratory conditions, the fungus, when isolated out of a lichen, cannot survive on its own for an extended period of time. The algae and the bacteria, however, can and as we've seen, they do exist as free-living organisms. So up to four different organisms living as a single lichen entity. Let's review. Fungus, algae, bacteria, yeast. Very good. But with all these different organisms commingled, how in the world is lichen reproduction even possible? Well, lichen reproduce primarily asexually by creating microscopic bundles called ceridia, that contain all the components, the fungus, the plant, the bacteria, the yeast, everything that makes up the lichen species. These little bundles, I like to think of them as little lunch boxes that are portable and self-contained. They're released into the air. If these little ceridia lunch boxes land on a suitable surface for growth, they'll begin the process of recreating the body or phallus of the lichen in the same arrangement as the parent lichen, only somewhere else far away from the parent. Isidia are lumpy outgrowths of the surface of the lichen that contain ceridia. When the Isidia break free of the surface and land on some choice real estate, each component begins to grow and eventually form a clone of the parent lichen. Sexual reproduction of lichen involves the fungus only. In lichen, the photobiont's ability to sexually reproduce is completely suppressed. The fungal component may produce viable fungal spores, often in cup-shaped structures called, remember, ascocarps. To form a new lichen from these fungal spores, the spores would have to germinate in the presence of other wild-living components unique to that lichen species. Now, I know this is chancy, but it's obviously happened or lichen would never have gotten started in the first place. No matter how the lichen originates by ceridia or magic recombination, once the propagule begins to grow, it reforms the basic structure found in all lichen. 
think of this basic structure like a peanut butter cup. A layer of phytobionts, like the peanut butter, is surrounded by a protective matrix of fungal fibers, like the chocolate. This arrangement gives the phytobionts access to sunlight while being protected from drying out from above. And the fungal matrix is able to adhere incredibly tightly to the surface the lichen is growing on. The protective role of the fungal chocolate coating has allowed lichens to inhabit extreme environmental conditions. This is one reason lichen be, can be found on every single continent and almost every conceivable environment. Lichen can be found growing on rock surfaces, in harsh climates that would prove lethal to even the toughest of the photobionts on their own. Check this out. Lichen have been observed performing photosynthesis while frozen at minus 20 degrees Celsius. That is survival. Scientists are currently working on a global index or checklist of lichen, and the number of different species is around 20,000. Some estimates suggest more than 30,000 species. That's a lot of lichen. Despite this vast diversity, the various growth forms basically boil down to three main types, crustos, folios, and fruticose. Crustose lichens are those that exist as though they were painted onto the surface where they grow. It's nearly impossible to lift a crustose-type lichen from the surface. Examples of crustos lichens include the very colorful Baton Rouge lichen. This lichen exists throughout the southeastern United States and appears as bright pink, often circular splotches on the trunks of trees. An interesting group of crustose lichen are called the script lichens. The body, or thallus, is marked with scribbles in areas where reproductive structures are forming. Script lichen are often found on smooth barked trees like red maple. Folios lichens are leafy, with thalli, the plural of thallus, that can be folded up and off the surface where they grow. Parmelia, or shield lichen, is a common genus of folios growth habit. The large and easily observed folio species can be found in a variety of habitats. Their abundance has led to their being used to monitor lichen growth rates, which are generally pretty slow, as well as air quality. You see, different species of lichen have different tolerances to air pollutants. Is that a fun fact? Finally, fruticose. Fruticose lichens are shrubby and typically elevated from the substrate they grow on. Terrestrial examples of fruticose lichen include deer moss and jester lichen. These two are abundant in Florida's oak hammock and pine flatwood habitats, but they're not fire adapted, and colonies can be totally lost after a wildfire. Usnea is another fruticose lichen often found growing on the trunks and branches of trees. The genus name translates as beard in Latin, and these multifilamentous lichens may appear as little beards hanging from tree branches, especially after a rain. A cute little fruticose lichen is called British Soldiers, or matchstick lichen. During its reproductive phase, this stick-like lichen bears a mass of reproductive structures on the tips that are bright red, like a British soldier's red uniform. Ecologically, lichen occupy a rather slim niche. Of course, since they contain photosynthetic organisms, they're almost constantly releasing oxygen into the environment. Those species that occur on bare rock can slowly, slowly, slowly erode the rock into smaller particles, eventually forming a basic soil structure. Lichen that occur in harsh environments like tundra and the vast frozen north can provide minimal sustenance to otherwise starving herbivores during the winter. On the subject of sustenance, some lichen are doubtless toxic if eaten. Given that they're partly made of fungus, it doesn't take much to imagine the potential for dire side effects resulting from eating them. Toxins can prevent being eaten, but lichen have to defend themselves from each other as well. By synthesizing toxic compounds, they can draw a line in the sand or 
on the tree branch, delimiting their property line so no other species can overtake their spot. So lichen's ability to synthesize complex, often toxic compounds for survival and self-defense has led researchers to explore lichen as the source of potential medicines. There's still much more to learn about lichen regarding their ecological roles, economic importance, and traditional uses around the world. But being slow growing, harvesting large amounts of lichen for any reason can cause significant population decline of a species, along with very slow recovery times. Lichen can be found just about everywhere outdoors. Lichen grow on fences, on window screens, on brickwork, and even the branches of plants in the landscape. Now, the appearance of lichen on a landscape plant may be linked to reduced plant health, but it's not the cause of the plant's decline. What's really happening is the plant's no longer growing vigorously and the lichen are just doing fine. They're outgrowing the sick plant. Lichen management for aesthetic purposes can be accomplished, but if lichens are on a living plant, their removal could damage the plant and create wound sites where plant pathogens could enter and cause real disease symptoms to develop. So the next time you're in the woods or even in your own backyard, take a look for these amazing organisms, these unlikely associations of three very different kingdoms of life.